Hey, Chris. Great to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Yes, I'm great. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No worries. And um, wh- where are you calling from? You're in London. Uh, just just are outside you? of London, Harpenden. Okay. But uh, do you, are you still going into the offices or do you normally work from home? Yeah, it's, I've got to say, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the sort of uh, flexible oh, working arrangements. So, you know, yeah. uh, in the office two or three days a week at home when it suits. Uh, I'm just yeah. getting over a cold, so I've been avoiding the office. None of my colleagues want to see me or <laughs> or, uh, or get my bacteria. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been pretty chilly recently. It's got a bit cold again. Yes. Um, I thought we could just, I could start by just talking about your background a little bit. And, and because I think you, you, I believe you got a doctorate, doctorate in philosophy at Oxford. And then obviously you've got, you've gone into finance and it'd be just interesting to see, you know, what attracts you to finance and also just generally how your career has gone. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, so I, I started out as a scientist, so I did a, a, a DPhil, yeah. a, a doctorate in, uh, inorganic chemistry, um, uh, more because I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life than anything else at that point in, in time. Um, and then, you know, took the sort of analytical side from the lab into uh, finance. I worked for, for a number of banks in research um, on the equity research side. And then uh, uh, almost eight years ago, I think I switched over from sell side research into the, the ETF business, which is obviously a, a big, a growing area of financial services. <laughs> yeah, the last 10 years for ETFs has been huge boom period isn't it so it's a yeah, great time on that front it's been it's been a fun place to work i can tell you that <laughs> and are you are you heavily involved in so at, at um invesco how are you you're constructing the etfs or working on the research behind what's involved or what's your real role there at the moment yeah, so, so my role in, uh, at invesco i'm i'm responsible uh, for sort of product management of the the equity etf products so um, so I work closely with our, our product development team in terms of coming up with ideas for, for new products. Um, yeah. But but primarily what I'm I'm doing is is acting as the sort of in-house expert uh, on the existing product suite. You know, Invesco has around about 140 um, uh, ETF products, um, of which almost 100 are, are equities. So when we get questions from clients or, you know, uh, when we're going out to talk to clients, I'm generally pulled, pulled in as the, uh, the, the expert on, on that, that yeah. product. And how many sort of thematic ETFs do you have in Vesco? Is it a large section? Or yeah, is it so thematics or? Is, is a reasonable sort of portion of, of the business. Um, so, you know, I, I think off the top of my head, we probably have about a dozen thematic ETFs uh, in Europe, you know, focused on things like, you know, clean energy, wind, hydrogen, etc. Um, uh, the 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 thing we're talking about today, you know, blockchain is a good example of the sort of the tech related thematics that yeah. we're we're exposed to. But we've had a long history there. We we launched our first thematic, which was a, a biotech product. Uh, I think you know, getting on for almost ten years ago now. So uh, it's it's certainly a big part of of what I talk about a lot. Yeah, yeah, and of course, yeah, today we're focusing on blockchain and um the Invesco ETF you've got but first I think we could it'd be good to discuss just more about the, the industry in general uh it's obviously been a crazy few years in, in, in all equities but crypto industry as well um uh, and that covers all blockchain any companies involved with blockchain but it, it feels like now you know we're coming out of uh the weeds and maybe you know the the, the uh the future's a little bit brighter now um where, where do you see the crypto industry in the next five to ten years? Are we are we still in its nascent phases, or what's the future hold? Yeah, so I think we're still in the early days. You know, it's it's important to remember that you know the 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 use of blockchain and the development of the technology. You know, it's just about ten years, oh, literally just over ten years since you know um, you know Bitcoin, the the white paper on Bitcoin was written, um, and we've been through you know a, a pretty in, in, incredibly uh, interesting and volatile ride um, since that point, um, but you know, where do we go in the next five or ten years? You know, I think it's it's a story of further strong growth. You know, the technology that sits behind cryptos, uh, NFTs, DeFi, and all the rest of it. You know, the blockchain technology is uh, has been proven to be robust. I think we're well beyond the um, proof of concept stage now. Um, but you know, uh, 
we're still in the foothills of 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 a of a, a journey to to the you know the, the peak of the mountains, as it were, in this space. Mm -hmm. And do you think we'll uh, ever get to a, a stage where people are paying for goods and services with some sort of cryptocurrency, whether or not it be you know centralized? digital currency or, or um, you know, the uncent decentralized ones? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, it's fair to say we've already seen examples of the, the use of, of, of cryptocurrencies, um, uh, not always successful given the, the sort of the volatility in, in crypto prices, um, but certainly, you know, blockchain based payment systems, I think, you know, uh, are almost certainly a part of, of, of our future, um, you know, and you know, we're seeing central banks around the world looking at, you know, CBDCs, so central bank digital currencies, you know, the, the question of whether we'll be paying for things digitally, you know, and you know, we are already paying for things online using standard fiat currency, you know, it's a, a small step to start using a, a digital version of those fiat currencies. Um, and, you know, uh, a, a lot of other uh, approaches beyond that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, so one of the main hurdles, as always, is, is, is regulation at the moment. Um, I think, well, in terms of paying for things with, with uh, cryptocurrencies, there's there's tax implications currently. I believe that um, make it just not uh, it's not not an user it's not user friendly to to, to pay for things because it, it's basically a tax event. So once once if you pay for something with a cryptocurrency, but it, it feels like um, Rishi is is quite uh, open to adopting um blockchain in more in general in both the you know both the government and and outside that and trying to attract business to the country so it, there was some good developments on that recently in the uk um which i think is positive but do you think uh more regulation is coming soon yeah very much so you know and, and i think it's it's a good thing and not a bad thing so you know you're referring to the the, the uk government announcement uh, earlier this month that you know uh, is just one example of you know increasingly uh, active regulation in this space but and there is still a question over how you regulate um cryptocurrencies and how you regulate you know um the, the related activities are, are around that but you know certainly you know we've seen you know last year part of the issue with ftx and the failure there was you know um you know a company that is set up and moves to a light touch regulation uh, area you know uh, is, is going to be a red flag for the future and should have been the red flag in the past, as it were. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, regulation in general is is a positive for this space. It means that, you know, you're setting in place adequate consumer protection. You're setting up a foundation for how things work within the law and within the regulation. And, you know, it allows you to deal with questions like, you know, if I pay for a cheese sandwich with a cryptocurrency, do I have to re recognize a, a capital gain or, or a capital yeah. loss, you know, whatever it may be. Those kind of complications actually become clearer with regulation and, and clarity is yeah. really what's what's required here. So regulation should should enable more mass adoption of, of these, the, the technology, yeah, essentially. In, indeed. Um, there's also this ongoing battle between uh, fiat currencies and decentralized non-state sort of money. I don't know if you could comment on that, If what you think, how the future might look for that. Will governments ever relinquish control of, of, of this or, you know, and adopt these decentralized currencies or, or will it always be a problem? Yeah, so, you know... I... It's, it's pitched as a battle. I think the reality is, you know, a lot of people, a lot of early adopters and early users and developers of cryptocurrencies, you know, the use case is very much around, you know, avoiding central government control and 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 giving, you know, uh, uh, an alternative system uh, for, for, for money, if you like. Um, the reality is that the average consumer in the street probably doesn't care too much about that they just want as as you sort of alluded to to be able to buy their their cheese sandwich and you know um <laughs> they're, they're, those are two very different places to be i think the reality is there will always be a place for you know a a, a bitcoin type uh, exposure and probably bitcoin is is it that you know allows you to have a currency that is independent of, of central control 
Uh, I think mm -hmm. what we will increasingly see is is central governments applying the lessons that are learned from from you know the the wild west of the crypto space and the developments that are happening in terms of technology. We've already mentioned CBDCs. You know, uh, those are definitely you know in the pipeline we're seeing a lot of work in that area and i think eventually there will be a a sort of a coming together of the, the sort of technology and the, the central government um will the us you know will the fed or the bank of england or the bank of japan ever you know give up managing currency and controlling the flow of money in their economies no clearly they're they're going to want to continue to yeah. do that and there's some very good reasons for doing so um but i think what what blockchain does, what crypto developments do, is is make that a more effective and efficient and and uh, uh, useful process. So th there is the potential for these to live in unison, basically. So it's not; yeah. it doesn't have yeah, to they, be one or the other. Yeah, exactly. They're going to sit side by side and work in tandem and, and interact as as they do already today. And you mentioned um, FTX. Um, one of the sort of themes of crypto, DeFi, uh, related to that is the collapse of Terra was a big sort of DeFi uh, failure. Do you think this will rebound in the next bull cycle? Is, is this a, a, a technology that, that has promise? Yeah, clearly. You know, I think you know what we're seeing, what we've seen in recent years are you know the the growing pains of. Uh, an early adoption of technology um you know the market the users of these things are, are learning as they go um these kind of uh, developments just take time uh, and as we've alluded to it's already you know we're we're just over a decade into to this journey um and it's going to take time for us to for for for, for the market to work out what does work what doesn't work um uh, there are going to be examples of things that are tried that 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 fail, you know. Yeah. And, and I think you know, uh, algorithmic stable coins, you know, for the average person, sounds like a, a you know a, a complicated quant product um, that may or may not uh, work. But the risks are that you know we have these sort of we know that black swans occur, and if you're you're building an algorithm that that you know uh, is you know, assuming certain set behaviors, you know that something is probably going to go wrong. Um, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that blockchain technology and the use case of blockchain technology goes away. You know, the, the building of stable coins that are linked to a holding of fiat currency, for example, which is already being used in, in a number of examples of uh, companies that, that are actually held in, in, in the, the, the ETF that we're running. You know, they clearly have a very good position and a strong backing and, and are much less at risk than something like a, a, a terror type of example. So, as I say, it's the the teething pains. We're still very much in the infancy of of the the uptake and development yeah. of blockchain technology. So it's the the ups and downs of disruptive innovation. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not going to be a very uh, very smooth journey. There there will be lumps and bumps on the road. But yeah, you know, I, I think it's. It's, it's always the way with these sort of long term thematic ideas as well, which is that we kind of we can see where we'll go to. It's it's up here and we can we know we're starting down here, but we know that we don't know quite how many valleys and peaks and troughs there will be yeah. on, on the way to, to, to get to that, that destination. Yeah. And in general, do you think the investment industry is um, underestimating the potential of blockchain from your point of view? Yeah, I think uh, I think there was an awful lot of hype around blockchain, you know, particularly post the, the you know, the, the, in the aftermath of the COVID crisis, we saw a huge activity in sort of the online world, which is obviously a, a, a strong place for you know more blockchain related activity. Um, we've seen, you know, huge sort of boom and then subsequent bust in in cryptocurrencies. Uh, on a number of occasions, you know, the uh, the, the 2021 22 experience uh, was not the first time we've seen a, a you know a potential bubble in in crypto assets, um, and I think a lot of people you know saw the sell off that we saw last year and 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 viewed that as a well you know we can call an end to this craziness now. Um, the reality is that there is still a place for for you know crypto and blockchain more broadly. 
Um, it may be a slower burn. And actually, frankly, that would be good news rather than the boom and bust sort of short term cycles yeah. that we've seen in, in crypto markets more recently. You know, but the reality is that slower burn, that uptake of technology and that usage of technology is still very much there. And it's still an area that, you know, investors can benefit from by sort of making the right decisions around getting uh, exposure to it. And the opportunity obviously exists when there's um, people underestimate the potential of something in, in, in the future. So, yeah, uh, you know, one of my one of my colleagues, you know, on the the um, uh, asset allocation research side says that, you know, the, the 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 best time to buy is often, you know, when you have to hold your nose and everyone else is 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 saying it stinks, you know. Um, so holding the course, taking a sort of more. Um, uh, longer term view is is you know it's a sort of classic of the investment industry it's we all say yeah. it's the way to invest not everyone manages to do it um one thing i would say is that when we look at the behavior of the investors in our etf um i would say that most investors are taking that long term view they're holding the course we saw last year so in a year where um you know crypto markets collapsed and and equities linked to, to to blockchain underperformed we actually saw net inflows rather than outflows now that was you know uh, about you know in, inflows in the first quarter and then you know some offsetting outflows in in the, the subsequent three quarters of the year but you know very limited in terms of the selling that we we saw in in mm -hmm. reaction to to what was happening last year um, so I think most investors in this space are taking a long term view. You, you sort of have to with a with an asset class that's so volatile. You sort of have to take this 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 long term view, don't you, to, to yeah. go through the ups and downs like that. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's very dangerous to try and pick buying moments. And in terms of use cases, what what? Have you got anything in mind you think is going to so any use cases that might lead to mass adoption of blockchain technology in, in daily life, either for businesses or consumers? Yeah, so, you know, I think there are already some some great examples where blockchain is already being used and you perhaps don't even realize it. You know, um, one example is the Food, tr net, tr food Trust Network. Um, which is uh, a system that's been set up and and is being run by the IBM um, uh, Blockchain Consulting Group, so their their consulting division, um, and that's bringing together uh, an amalgamation of food producers, um, uh, food retailers, and food suppliers, <clears throat> and using blockchain technology to track the supply chain of of, of food deliveries. Now, you know, that may not sound like the, the sexiest and most exciting thing, but by being able to directly track, <coughs> excuse me, by being able to directly track the movement of, say, I don't know, a, a head of lettuce from, you know, the, the greenhouse it was grown in to, the, to the, 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 the plot in the greenhouse it was grown in to the refrigerator it was kept in, the lorry it was transported in to the shop it was taken to, the warehouse it was taken to, wherever, all the way through to the, the journey to the to the, the shelf in, in the shop yeah. has, you know, potentially huge benefits in terms of, you know, disease control um, uh, and, and you know, efficient cost control around mm -hmm. the supply chain in, in, in food. And there's that's being used today by, you know, the likes of, of Walmart and Carrefour and, you know, Nestle and, and so on are all members of that, that consortium that are supporting that blockchain use case. And how um how is blockchain used in that? Is that is that is that because they're able to um encrypt the, the like codes into it so that you can't be tampered with and things? Is that is that what the use case is? Yeah, so it's it's ultimately about so if you think about what blockchain's doing here, ultimately it's it's acting as a shared record keeping system. So you have multiple components in that chain of, of supply, whether it's the, the, the grower, the freight haulage company, the storage company, the, the supermarket or whoever. Um, and at each of those chain steps in the chain, each of those interactions recording accurately what's moved from where to where, all of those transfers that are occurring, you know, used to be done on, you know, um, multiple pages of, you know, carbon copy paper flimsies. Uh, is now done on a on a centralized IT system 
the advantage of blockchain is that you only have one centralized IT system. You don't have multiple records with different companies yeah, and yeah. different uh, actors. Um, okay. And it's blockchain technology that's enabling that. So it's a lower cost and more efficient, but it's also more uh, uh, accurate tracking of movement is, is what you're looking oh, Very for. interesting. Let's move on to the Invesco CoinShares Global Blockchain ETF. Um, we've obviously talked about it a, li a little bit already, and I just thought you could go into the details of, of what the ETF uh, is and how, um, the sub-themes involved, as well as the investment philosophy behind it. Yeah, so very much the ETF is designed to give investors exposure to you know, the growth in blockchain technology in all its different forms. Uh, it's an equity product, so it's investing in companies that are most directly exposed to, to the, the blockchain growth story. Um, uh, and if you think about the, 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 the blockchain exposure, it sort of goes from across a spectrum from, um, uh, you know, the, the thing that most people think about when they think of uh, blockchain, which is crypto um, and that, you know, public or open and permissionless blockchain technology uh, and and all the uses that, that go with that and you know there are some obvious uh, examples of companies that are, are, are sort of directly growing their earnings today from uh, business business activities related to that so whether that's you know cryptocurrency miners um, uh, the suppliers to those miners, whether it's you know uh, specialist chip manufacturers or or the energy uh, providers um, uh, for for crypto mining activity in 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 Bitcoin, for example, um, right through to the other end of the the spectrum, which are if you like um, private or or closed blockchain technology users, um, and you know while most people think think of crypto when they think of blockchain, there's also a very strong um, uh, enterprise use case, as it were. So, you know, for example, in things like supply chain management, in things like uh, payment systems, um, and you know, the, the the back office plumbing of the yeah. financial services world, you know, blockchain is you know clearly uniquely suited to that. And there's a wide range of companies out there that uh, are also you know seeing today real, measurable, genuine earnings coming from those kind of activities as as well. And the key role of the ETF is to give a, a broad exposure to all of those areas, um, weighted by um, you know the significance of, of their their blockchain activity exposure. And it seems to be quite a broad geographic makeup of the ETF, including a heavy focus on on Japan, which is quite an interesting. You sort of cherry picked uh, the best companies from across the globe. Yeah, so the approach we've taken is, you know, it's it's a bottom up approach. So we've we've company uh, we've we've partnered with with a company called CoinShares, you know, who I think most people in the the, the, the crypto space will recognise the name. You know, they're one of the one of Europe's largest, um, you know, uh, uh, crypto asset management firms, um, and uh, analysts within their the the, the team at, at CoinShares are are you know focused on, you know assessing companies, identifying companies, uh, assessing their exposure to uh, blockchain uh, activities uh, across a range of, of different measures um, uh, and assigning a blockchain category score to those companies. Now, you've identified that there's a, you know, a bias towards, you know, uh, Japanese uh, and, and Korean companies or certainly a larger weight than you'd find in a sort of standard broad global benchmark. Um, uh, and the reason for that is that that's an area where uh, an area of the world where regulation and and um, uh, insight um, is very much more focused, perhaps, on, on blockchain technology. So it's not by design, it's by bottom up analysis that those are where you find the yeah. companies with the um, sort of greatest opportunity yeah. set in um, the blockchain space. Um, so I thought we could dig into a few of the sub themes in a bit more detail, including some of the, the holdings in ETF. Um, so I thought we could start the blockchain payment systems, you said, like enterprise solution, but also uh, relevant to consumers. So Block being one of the ones that's, that comes to mind. Are there other, other companies that um, in there you, you can discuss as well as Block um, and what they're actually doing? Yeah, so um, so so, Block is a great example. You know, so most people would recognise it uh, perhaps by its previous name, which was Square. <laughs> 
Um, I think the renaming probably reflects the sort of direction of travel for the company. But you know, so so Block is a it's a financial services and mobile payments company um, focused um, uh, primarily on on point of sale solutions for retailers so you know if you if you think back uh, only a few years if you went to the local market to, to buy something you had to pay cash you know today you 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 know you can tap your card on a little device that's linked to you know the, the mobile phone of of the you know the, the person you're transacting with um and you know block was a was a pioneer in that space and um, why are they in this index well because they also support the use of, of Bitcoin in trading and payments um, on their mobile app in in the US and the UK, um, and actually when you look at the numbers on on Block, you know Q3, which is the last um, uh, quarter we have data for, um, it, they had revenue of something like 1.8 billion dollars related to Bitcoin activities, which is around about 40 percent of total group revenue. So this is this is a big chunk of you know the the growth story of, of a company like Block. Um, other payment systems examples um, recently, actually, at the, the latest rebalance, which occurred at the uh, end of January, start of February, um, uh, we saw PayPal come into um, the uh, the index um, because they're taking steps to integrate um, uh, sort of more blockchain related activities into to their business as well. Um, so there are a number of, of great examples and, and payment systems is a good example of where you know the use of blockchain can can certainly enhance mm-hmm. the returns for you know the, the the companies involved. Yeah, you can see the early adopters of this, such as Block. As soon as we get over some of these regulatory hurdles related to tax, uh, you know it's going to unlock that completely. And suddenly, you know, when you know your friend is using, you know, Bitcoin to pay for something down the road, it, it spreads very qu- quickly when it's easy to use in, in, a, in an app such as as Block. Um, but yeah, there is the, just the, I think it's the regulatory stuff that needs to we get over first uh, related to payments in, in in crypto. And then so moving on to mining, and I thought we could start with um, the operational mining side. Now mining is obviously uh, primarily <laughs> used for Bitcoin now because Ethereum's moved um, from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, so no longer has mining operations related to it, and so largely a lot of these a lot of these companies are related to Bitcoin, and, and they basically maintain the system, verifying the transactions to make sure you know the Bitcoin ecosystem keeps on running, and they get rewarded by that um, for that. Sorry, in in Bitcoin, and I think um, mining. I looked just a second ago. Mining revenue is up to twenty one million dollars a day at the moment, so so pretty good sort of global revenue from Bitcoin mining. What and it's related to the success of Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin as well. What do you see the future holds for the mining operations? Yeah. So again, crypto mining is a, is, is, is an obvious activity that's you know, sort of directly linked to, you know, performance and activity in, in, in Bitcoin, as you, you've been talking about, you know, it's a, it's a more nuanced question, I guess. So total revenue is, 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 is obviously very much linked to, you know the the number of Bitcoin that are mined, and you know the um, uh, the price of Bitcoin at the point at which you know that that mining company sells it. You know the last twelve months have been a pretty difficult time for for crypto miners, um, and the reason for that is obviously you know the, the the value of Bitcoin until the start of this year has been falling, you know, um, pretty significantly. Um, so from a from a you know value perspective, they they've been hurt. Um, the other thing that's been happening is that the hash rate has been going up. So the hash rate is referring to uh, effectively how many miners are trying to solve the problem, the, the you know the uh, the cryptographic problem, which is required to you know add uh, new transactions to the blockchain. And the higher the hash rate, it's telling you the more there are more miners or there are more mining machines being applied to, to try to do that. And and Bitcoin has a you know, a, a, a effectively an adjustment mechanism, which is the more miners there are, or the more machines, the more power is being put into to solving those problems. Uh, the harder the problem gets, in order to make sure that you're still producing, effectively producing the same number of Bitcoin. Um, that's a pretty uncomfortable place for a lot of miners. Um, you know, uh, as they are effectively having to share their revenues across a wider base. Um, and you know that that goes against a, a cost base that's also potentially rising with rising energy costs. Um, so 
it isn't a straightforward story of all miners benefit equally from uh, you know uh, the, the the increased uh, revenues. Um, however, there are some miners that are better positioned to to deal with that world that have, for example, lower cost bases or um, you know um, uh, 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 more efficient and effective machines. Um, uh, and uh, and what the CoinShares analysts are doing is identifying, you know, which of the mining companies are best placed to, um, you know, survive yeah. in you know a competitive market. And a, an example of that is Hive, I think, is 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 that um, an ETF? Yeah. So there are a few crypto miners that make it through. So Hive is one. Um, uh, oh, actually, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, so Hive is one good example of that. You know, that's a North American based miner with, you know, uh, a, a secure supply of energy. And ultimately, if you think about mining, you know, what are your input costs? Your input costs are, you know, the price of the, the, the hardware that you're using and the price yeah. of the energy that you're, you're using yeah. very much. If you're looking at miners, you know, companies that have a secure supply from, uh, preferably from sort of isolated energy assets. And this is one of the things that makes Bitcoin mining interesting. You know, it can actually use, for example, uh, you know, hydroelectric dam, you know, uh, miles from, from anywhere uh, that's been built for aluminium smelting. If the price of aluminium falls and smelting is no longer yeah. viable, you know, uh, monetizing that asset um, using crypto mining is, is, a, is a good example of a, a low cost energy source. Um, so, in terms of the uh, the ETF, we have exposure not only to the crypto miners themselves, but also, you know, to certain companies that have you know could potentially benefit from monetizing those those um, isolated energy assets. Yeah, and you can see the the ones that do survive the downturn and, and, and thrive in the in the next bull cycle as long as Bitcoin's adopted, etc. Have you know huge benefits as long as they can maintain the energy costs at, at good levels. And yeah. um, just something that popped into my mind, and um, people, I hope that people don't get, um, aren't too, uh, I don't know if I'm too far out on it, but I think it's by two, 2100 or something, the last Bitcoin is mined. Um, I believe that's the right. And it, something like that, uh, it's sometime in the future. And, and at that point, I actually, I just don't know myself. Do you, do you know what happens to the miners at that point? Do they, I mean, obviously, they've still got to maintain the system, but there's new, no new Bitcoin to be mined. Yeah, so so I guess the key thing here is that um, you know miners don't have to maintain the system; they only do it because they're being rewarded for doing it. You know, this isn't a centralized system, um, and uh, you know miners earn revenue from two potential sources. One is from the creation of new currency, new native currency, Bitcoin in this case, that is used to reward them for doing the work that's required to add new transactions. Um, the other source of revenue for those um, miners is um, transaction fees that they can charge to um, uh, users of Bitcoin that want to have their transaction added okay. to the block. Um, and, you know, obviously the, there's a sliding scale on fees. The higher the fee you're willing to pay, the higher up the list of transactions your transaction goes, the sooner it will be added to, to the blockchain. Um, in the future, case in the future world where you know there are no new bitcoins being issued to to reward miners for that work it's a a, a payment for transaction basis that, that, that will be existing okay. on interesting and uh related to this is mine, mine. and it's interesting because i don't think i was going to say i don't think anyone actually knows quite how yeah, that will yeah, shake no, out you know that's the theory of where we end up but you're right you know um uh, one of the questions over over Bitcoin is, you know, what happens when you stop issuing new Bitcoin? One of the advantages of Bitcoin, one of the things that people love about it is that it, you know, uh, has that sort of uh, uh, inflation proof nature of uh, a known amount of issuance, sort of similar yeah. to, to gold in the digital space. Yeah. It's both a pro and a con because, you know, you need to work out how that, that system will work in the future. But uh, revenue uh, transaction based uh, payments is is the likely outcome and obviously those miners by, by that time um a huge proportion of them probably built up huge assets they don't have to sell all their bitcoin right so if that keeps on going up it compounds like they're both getting rewarded at that point in time a certain amount and as long as it goes up over time that amount's going up um exponentially i suppose as they keep on getting more and more bitcoin 
Yeah, yeah. If they have a vested interest in the system, then that's another reason why they may still continue to mine. Um, although I would say that in the last 12 months, the sell off that we've seen in the crypto markets has seen an increase in selling of crypto by the yeah. miners. So being paid in Bitcoin and, and not selling it you know, is, is kind of fine when the price is going up. Um, uh, when the price is going down, you start to have to monetize that. that. And, and again, that's yeah. potentially been another sort of, you know, sort of a, a multiplying effect on, on the, 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 the weakness yeah. in, in Bitcoin yeah. prices. And I mean, we'd have to cover this one because it's quite pretty self-explanatory, but bi- mining hardware is obviously um, the mining computers that, that you know, the, the miners buy to, to perform the operations. And obviously business hasn't been, hasn't been as good recently because, you know, mining's been become more difficult. But do you see these recovering essentially, uh, you know, with, with price recovery in, in, in Bitcoin? Yeah, and again, I think you know the the key thing is there is there is a cyclical nature to demand for for mining hardware. You know, when the price of Bitcoin's going up, and you know uh, it becomes more attractive to mine it, then you know miners will be looking to replace aging hardware to improve the speed of, of processing um, and in, you know improve their you know success rate. Um, and there are a number of companies out there that, that benefit when you're in that upswing. A good example is TSMC is one of the larger holdings in in the the, the, the ETF. You know, it's there because you know TSMC. I think everyone probably recognises the name. It's one of the largest um, uh, independent chip foundries in the world, or in fact, it's the largest independent chip foundry in the world. Um, it's also the largest supplier of specialist chips for um, crypto asset mining. And it's an interesting market for them. You know, uh, effectively, what they're doing is they they get you know a, a significant benefit when demand for those types of chips goes up. They're manufacturing on on demand with with pre prepayment, so it's a, a sort of a lucrative business for them. It's boosting the profitability of TSMC uh, yeah. during those upswings in the cycle. Um, and when it, when there's a downswing in the cycle, you know, it's not like TSMC has some kind of huge amount of cost into to manufacturing those chips. Um, it, it, it's in a very sort of good position in that marketplace. Um, is it the biggest part of TSMC's business? You know, almost certainly not. You know, uh, it, probably seven to ten percent of TSMC's revenue uh, in a quarter uh, was attributable to, to sort of sale of mining chips uh, at the peak of, of the activity levels. You know, and, and as we sort of discussed, it can go to, yeah. to zero. But you know, TSMC is a great example of the sort of stock that actually does give you sort of exposure to the upside potential um they're generating real earnings today um but you know they also have a stable yeah. strong business that you know will continue and you know bitcoin and blockchain is really just a, a an, an add-on to, to you know what's an existing strong business model and moving on to energy so this is providing energy to the mining companies to perform their operations is, is that what we're talking about there yeah, so this is, uh, as I was saying, you know, uh, often for a Bitcoin miner, you know, the the the, the largest cost will be the cost of, of the energy going into running the computers. And, and of course, you know, that's that's a sort of source of contention. Mm-hmm. What that means, though, is that Bitcoin miners are often looking for the lowest cost source of energy in order to, to, to run their activities. And, and Bitcoin mining itself is, if you like, a uniquely transportable um, use of, of energy. So it doesn't make sense for them to plug into the local grid next to you know a, a, a large city where there's a lot of demand for electricity from industrial sources and so on and, and consumers. It makes a a lot of sense for them to find energy assets that are underutilized that they can um, uh, use as a as a low cost source of energy and at the same time it means that the owner of that energy asset is also monetizing something that perhaps mm. maybe you know is a hangover from a previous investment cycle i used the example earlier of um, uh, uh, hydroelectric dams built you know where the where the water is and where the conditions are um, uh, so often miles, yeah. hundreds or thousands of miles from civilization and, and obvious sources of, of demand for electricity, you know, they were built for smelting aluminium and aluminium is itself a sort of uniquely transportable 
uh, uh, energy use um, as moving the bauxite to a dam to smelt it and and then move the finished aluminium, you know, uh, made sense or makes sense monetarily. Um, but if you're not smelting aluminium, you know, effectively smelting uh, 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 Bitcoin is is another use for for that. So there are a number of names in in the index that often raise a, an eyebrow from investors. You know, um, the the likes of the, the Rio Tintos of the world that you think, what on earth is a is a is a a physical mining company doing in a in a blockchain index? But it's because you know blockchain is again another way of of monetizing their existing yeah. business and their existing assets. It, and is, so some of these miners. I hadn't realized this is pretty interesting. So they're, they're setting up shop right outside these hydroelectric dams, et cetera. And is that because it's, it's, you lose a lot yeah. of, is it, it's inefficient to, to transfer that energy to a city? So is, is it better to use it as a source? Yeah. So if you have a hydroelectric dam in, I don't know, the middle of Canada, miles from, you know, in uh, civilization, a mile from a city, you know, the energy loss in trans yeah. moving that that electricity produced by the hydroelectric dam to uh, a big city is is too great to be worth the investment in building, oh, wow. yeah. you know, the infrastructure to transport it. Um, uh, and actually, you know, uh, a, a crypto miner, you know, literally, you can put your device, you know, the the mining machines into a, a container and ship the container to where it needs to be. The only other infrastructure you need is a, a, a you know a link yeah. to the internet, um, and you're and you're up and running. So it's it's that that I is so. you know um, you know the the, yeah. the benefit from from and crypto the, mining, the clean from, energy, from energy sources. It supports the sort of narrative at the moment because you know it has some bad press. Bitcoin or the press picked it up for for using too much energy. Um, yeah, and and again, you know. I think it's fair to say that, you know, crypto miners are, are sort of source agnostic. They just care about the cost. So there are some examples where, you know, in particular in China, you had, oh. um, you know, um, the, the use of coal as your source, you know, stranded coal assets. Um, uh, I, th- I guess that has decreased to, a, to an extent, but it is yeah. still part of, of the, you know, the, the question. Um, again, the... ETF itself is is exposed to companies that are gener- generally generating assets from generating uh, using energy generated from you know um, cleaner sources yeah. of energy than than Kazakhstan coal or whatever. And moving on to token investments, um, can you touch on what those are? Are these companies such as MicroStrategy who are invested in a token, or are you talking more about blockchain firms that have their own token? Yeah, so so t- the the token investment um, category that that is used is specifically talking about um, companies that are, are being held in the ETF for their exposure to uh, crypto yeah. assets. Uh, it's an in, it's an interesting. It's sort of a, a a very small part of the index. So in fact, there's only one company that is currently being held for its exposure in in the token investment ca- category, and that's uh, as as you've identified, MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy is itself is a, a software as a service uh, company, um, but its uh, management team took the decision to invest um, a, 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 a reasonable proportion of their treasury assets into Bitcoin uh, a number of years ago. Um, and so uh, what MicroStrategy has effectively become today is a listed entity that gives exposure to the performance of the Bitcoin price. Um as I say, it's an unusual thing in the the the, the index and the ETF uh, as as the only example in that space. It's also worth emphasising the ETF is only investing in companies, so it won't be investing in you know other funds that are holding crypto assets. It won't be investing in or it doesn't invest in crypto assets yeah. directly. Um, it's purely investing yeah. in companies, and, and MicroStrategy is an interesting example there, but. But a, a, an oddity rather yeah. than the norm. Yeah, MicroStrategy is a very interesting one. A lot of people that I, I talk to and discuss um, this with it almost position it as a binary bet on Bitcoin. Basically, I, either it succeeds, you know, and, and people are, it's adopted, which means with the amount of Bitcoin they've got today, I mean, it could be one of the most valuable companies in the world theoretically down the line, or it's not, and you know, then therefore this asset sheet is, is worth nothing. But um, 
that's a pretty good binary bet to me if you if you see what I mean. The down the downside is a lot lower than the potential upside. So the the risk reward on it, uh, if you know if if taken in, in the right way, is, is is pretty interesting. Um, let's move on to blockchain financial services. Now, I th- does this cover exchanges and such, such as Coinbase, CoinCheck, I think, which is a, an exchange on part of Monex, which is a Japanese crypto bank. They have other things there, but is that is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, so so the financial services side are, are companies that are uh, either involved in, as you've said, exchange-related activities, or it's companies that are involved in facilitating, you know, the 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 activities of 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 more crypto related businesses so you know companies like silvergate that's had a pretty tough time on the on the back of um um the ftx uh failure um but companies in that sort of space so you've mentioned two examples there you know coinbase is a great example you know it's uh, a a company that adds uh, effectively as a prime broker within the, the the crypto space so it it's facilitating lending trading credit intermediation of, of, of trading activities in the cryptocurrency space. Um, another good example uh, is, as, as you mentioned, CoinCheck. So CoinCheck itself is uh, actually owned by uh, a, a Japanese um, brokerage uh, and crypto exchange business called Monix. So, uh, and again, the story behind this is, is quite interesting. So Monix have acquired CoinCheck in, I think it was 2018. Um, uh, basically bailing CoinCheck out after um, they'd had a, a, a big hack. And again, I was going to say in the early days of the cryptocurrency story, 2018 is only, uh, you know, uh, five years ago now. But, um, you know, it's still very early in the crypto story. Um, and one of the key features here, and we talked about regulation previously, one of the key features here is that, you know, the Jap- Japanese financial regulator required a regulatory entity to acquire Coincheck, Coincheck being one of the you know, largest crypto exchanges in, yeah. in Japan, so Monex as a as a regulated entity already, you know, was in a position to acquire that attractive asset, and you know has has you know uh, done very well out of that acquisition, uh, and it's a good example of how regulation um, is is key to the success of yeah. some of these businesses. Um, and a good relationship and a good understanding of regulation is 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 key. And Monex is, I believe, one of the largest holdings on on the ETF. Um, it's not just CoinCheck, the, the crypto exchange that they have. Is it they they've got a big research and consulting arm as well? Is that right? And are they are they consulting other businesses? Is, is that yeah? So so yeah. So a lot of this is a good example of, of a lot of the firms in that are being held by the ETF. You know, they may be held by the ETF for, because there's an obvious business activity. Uh, they're also obviously linked activities outside of that. So, you know, in many cases, there are, are multiple reasons why those companies are, are in the index. You know, the approach that's taken to identifying companies is very much around, you know, assessing, you know, what are the what is the blockchain business they're involved in today? What development stage is it at? You know, how competitive is it? You know, what is the future earnings potential? What is the current earnings? You know, how significant is that for for the um, for the business itself? And overall, what the analysts are doing is is looking at, at, at that in in aggregate and assigning a blockchain category score from five being you know the maximum to to zero being not involved, but one being the lowest for, that would get you included in the index. Um, and by making that broad uh, assessment of the company, it enables you to identify companies that have a, a greater potential or greater exposure. And the reality is that you know today in the blockchain space, in the listed company space exposed to blockchain, you know you can't build an, an index, you can't build an ETF with you know fifty companies that are pure yeah. plays on on blockchain activity. So. Yeah. You know there is a balance to be had there. So you know uh, companies like TSMC um, have a score that's sort of in in the middle, uh, moderate exposure. Companies like Hive have a very high score. Um, we also include you know a company like IBM, for example, which we we've sort of not really talked about, but did mention you know their um, their consulting arm that has a score of one. You know it, clearly they're a market leader in consulting on 
uh, on the, the enterprise blockchain side, but is their blockchain consulting business going to be the biggest driver of their earnings? Probably yeah. not, not today anyway. So it's that balance of finding investable liquid and meaningful exposure. So just um, building on this and on the how your companies are selected and waiting to find... Um, so that initial phase of how you how you select companies is that like is the same sort of procedure? So you've got this ranking system. They've got a big pool of this universe that they're looking at, and they're only selecting the ones that um, have the highest ratings. And then the weightings are defined more select best based on some assessment criteria. Um, and I've written down here because I've, I've I've had a look, but based on earnings significance, uh, earnings potential, like you've just mentioned. Uh, the blockchain development stage, blockchain business competitive positioning, and blockchain business sustainability. Yeah, so the analysts are uh, are looking at each country against five criteria and scoring on each of those five criteria. And then ultimately, you come up with an aggregate score that is the average of those five pillar scores. Um, You know, the specifics of what what they'd be analysing, what they'll be looking at for... um, uh, uh, an individual business will obviously depend on the business activity that they're involved in. Um, it also depends on things like availability of data and, and so on. So um, so there's no uh, sort of standard rule of must have X percent earnings, revenue, whatever. Um, but all of those criteria are part of, of the assessment. Um, uh, and, and again, uh, uh, this is a good example of a thematic uh, uh, area and a problem for, the, for thematic products if you like or problem to solve for thematic products is you know very often you want to be involved in a a thematic area early in its uh, uh, in its growth and early in its growth it's often hard to find you know uh, the best quality data and the you know segment breakdowns and so on so a lot of the 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 work that the coin shares analysts are doing is talking to companies um, meeting with management, visiting um, uh, their factories or, or you know, business locations, talking to their suppliers, talking to their customers, going to conferences, and you know, keeping in touch with what's happening in right. the blockchain technology space, you know, uh, and really forming a, a, a good picture of what's happening in the blockchain universe to allow them to you know sort of make these assessments. And in terms of rebalancing and how and why constituents are added or removed from the index. Um, how, how is that determined? Are things like, I mean, we touched on Coinbase earlier very quickly. Uh, I mean, with the collapse of FTX was obviously a big negative for the industry short term. Hopefully, you know, a regular, you know, it might be fast track some regulation actually builds and gets a net positive in the future. But a big positive for Coinbase is it's lost one of its main direct competitors in the market for the US. So, you know that that's that's pretty positive. Is, that, is this the sort of thing that they'll take into account, or? Yeah, so I guess you know, in assessing Coinbase and whether it gets included or not, you know, part of that equation was you know what is the competitive space and you know how do they sit, uh, and obviously the the failure of of other businesses will affect that um, uh, assessment. Um, but ultimately, uh, I guess it's a longer term assessment that's being made. It's not just about the very short term. Um, so while you know those short term changes in in the market, you know, will be fed into the assessment. It's you know, ultimately you're focused on what is the longer term uh, outcome because that's what investors in in the ETF will be caring about. And just to wrap it up, I thought we could just. Talk about what blockchain is obviously, you know, we talked, said, discussed earlier, everyone knows it's a highly volatile theme. Um, and ETF is a good way to exposure that, get exposure to the theme because it's at least diversified within the theme, but it still can be volatile. Um, how should investors approach can incorporate an ETF like this into their portfolio? Yeah, so I think, you know, the key thing is it, it, with any sort of long term. Uh, thematic investment, you know, whether it's blockchain or biotech or, you know, fintech or or, or clean energy or whatever, um, they all have some similar characteristics, which is, as you've identified, you know, um, they can be more volatile, they tend to be more concentrated portfolios, um, uh, and therefore can, you know, both underperform and outperform the, the market. You know, I guess for me, the key thing for an investor 
is needs to be focused on is you know uh, what is the long-term growth story do i believe in the long-term growth story and if the answer to that is yes you know you've got to be in a position that you can accept the volatility that comes some of those peaks and troughs on the journey from here to that you know that long-term uh, you know growth outcome um i think most investors that that i talk to uh, incorporate this kind of ETF into their portfolio as a uh, using a sort of core satellite type of approach. So they'll have a core holding of I don't know, you know, broad global equities, um, and then sitting around that, they'll be investing, you know, a proportion of their portfolio into, you know, perhaps a, a selection of of you know thematic uh, approaches. You know, so some exposure to blockchain, some exposure to um, clean yeah. energy, some exposure to yeah. biotech or whatever. Um, and that in in that way, you know, they know they've got a more volatile asset, uh, but they're not fully, you know, investing the, the whole portfolio in it. Um, and again, I guess the the key thing is, you know, what is your investment horizon, and and what are the risks that you can bear? You know, if you've got to pay your kids' university tuition fees next year, you know, then. Uh, putting that money, all of that money into a, a thematic in, in ETF, uh, equity ETF is, is not the right place to be. If you're saving for your pension that's going to come through in 20 years, yeah. then, you know, that's uh, perhaps a more appropriate place to, to put it. Themes often take many years to play out, don't they? You've got to give them time to get over those hurdles. Yeah. And like you said, it would be very, suddenly they'll have a year where they do exceptionally well and then, you know, you'll have sort of underperforming for, for the next six months and stuff like that. And that's a per- you know, this is a perfect example of that. So in uh, uh, we had one one year in 2020, the blockchain ETF returned more than 90 percent. Um, uh, last year, it, it dropped just over 50 percent. So you know, this is a volatile investment in you know a, a volatile and exciting space in the market. But you know, since inception, you still had you know. Uh, 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 positive returns and, and better returns than you you could have got from you know a, a sort of broader global benchmark, but but boy has it been a a, a busy ride yeah, on the way a roller coaster. Well, Chris, thanks so much uh, for the discussion. <laughs> it's, it's been it's been really really interesting to dig into uh, the details of, of the ETF and understand uh, you know more about how they, all these sub themes and how they're playing out, how important they are um, to the whole blockchain industry. And you know specifically the makeup of the ETF. Uh, we'll include a link to the ETF in the show notes for anyone who's, who's interested. So we'll, we'll do that. Um, so please check it out. Is there anything else you'd like to leave with Chris? No, just to say thank you for for inviting me to to join you here. It's been a, a, an interesting chat. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, they can obviously reach out to you or reach out to, to Invesco, and uh, we'll be happy to help. Thanks, Chris. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.